thing. And today is the 10th. Okay. So a parasite can harm you. What else do you know about parasites? You know. Feeds off of a host. What else do you know? <clears throat> Anybody have an example of a parasite? A parasite that they're familiar with? Mm, not really. So let's let's go ahead and, and put down all of our ideas and then we'll look at the definition of a parasite and see if it fits or not. <clears throat> a leech? A tick. Oh yeah, I just had a really nice parasite not too long ago. I had a lovely little deer tick. What? It will be a parasite. Oh, I'm, I bet there is. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay, what's another example or something else you know about parasites? Has anybody here ever had a parasite? Ticks, leeches, if you've ever gotten bitten by a flea. <clears throat> Okay. Ooh, tapeworms are parasites. Tapeworms are great parasites. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that gives us um, two different types of parasites. Okay, anything else you know? So remember, we're talking about these in the context of community ecology. So community ecology is how populations of different species in an ecosystem sort of work and play together. And lo and behold, parasites are part of those communities. So we've already talked about um, predation. And today we're going to start to talk about parasitism. So as a relationship between populations of different species in a community, you have a relationship with your parasites. They want something from you, you don't want them. <clears throat> okay, so in a parasitic relationship, one species is definitely harmed in some way. And I say harmed, but not killed. And the other species benefits, they gain something from the relationship. An individual of one species, the parasite, feeds on an individual of another species, which is the host. Okay. So the one, one individual is harmed, the other spent, but not killed typically, not at least directly or not quickly, um, and the other species benefits. So you named some examples here. Um, leeches. Who here has ever had a leech on their body? Okay. If you haven't, you need to go spend more time stomping around in shallow, muddy water. Nothing quite like picking leeches off your ankles after you've been wading through whatever. Um, <laughs> some people's idea of fun. Okay, so in that relationship where the leech is attached to your ankle, it's sucking blood. Are you being harmed? Yeah. A tiny little bit. I mean, what does a leech want from you? Blood! And you can, you can, oh, shoot. Okay. So, is a leech going to kill you? No. It's probably going to freak you out. Who shrieks when they see a leech? I did the first couple times I got leeches. I don't anymore. I just go, eh, got a leech. What about ticks? Who's had a tick? Okay. Tick going to kill you? Well... That's a, how? If you get Lyme disease. Lyme disease won't typically kill you. It'll make you real sick. Um, can the tick itself, so let's separate something. I'm really glad you brought that up. Parasites don't always harm you directly. So will the tick itself kill you? No. Can one little tick suck out enough blood to endanger your life? No. no. Can a tick give you a disease? 
that can harm you in some way. Yes. So that's a separate issue because that disease organism is a bacteria. It's a different organism. Okay. All right. So typically these parasites don't kill you. They just take a little bit from you. What about a tapeworm? Somebody mentioned tapeworm. What do tapeworms do? When I was a kid, there was a guy my dad worked with, and Hal was real tall and real skinny. And there was some there was some place they went near work for lunch sometimes. It was an all you can eat buffet, and they used to say that Hal could drive that place right out of business because the man could eat like no one you have ever seen. I mean, he he could eat like a teenage boy, you know, who was running three sports. He just could shovel food into his body, and he never gained a pound. He was still like six foot two and skinny long tall guy. And they used to joke, Hal's got to have a tapeworm. There's no way. He's got to have a tapeworm. He didn't. He just had that kind of metabolism. What do tapeworms do? Yeah, they live in your gut. um, And they have little hooks. They attach to the wall of your intestine. And they take nutrients away from you. Now, they actually, it's a misnomer to say that, like, you could be really skinny because you had a tapeworm and you ate a lot, but the tapeworm got the calories. They don't get the calories. <laughs> they just get the nutrients. So having a tapeworm will not magically, you know, allow you to eat anything you want, nothing but ice cream sundaes all day, and never gain a pound. They'll just take nutrients and leave you malnourished. So tapeworms are not the answer for, like, wrestlers or anything. Um, I can see the wheels turning. But, okay, so we've got a relationship where you've got somebody feeding on you but not killing you and somebody who's doing the feeding who's being harmed, but they're not being killed. Okay, here are some lovely pictures of parasites. Hmm. Unlike predators who kill their prey, parasites usually don't kill their host. Parasites usually do not kill their host, or at least not intentionally. Not on purpose. Why don't parasites usually kill their hosts? Yeah, so parasites don't really have an interest in killing their host, at least not quickly, because the longer that host stays alive, the longer they can take nutrients from them, the longer they can take something from them. So these little guys are pinworms. We'll talk a lot about them. These are some sort of probably like a liver fluke. And this, oh this, those are bot flies. Doesn't that just look like a pimple? Guess what's inside that pimple? A larva, a maggot. Anybody ever seen a bot fly? They're pretty common on cows and horses. Um, and when I used to have a lot of barn cats, every, you know, every year I'd get one cat who would have a bot. So the bot is a fly that comes along, it lands on an animal, it can land on a human, it can land on a cow or a horse or a cat or a dog, and it lays an egg under their skin. So you know how a mosquito can stick its little proboscis, its, its little sort of syringe into your body and pull blood out? Bot flies have a little syringe that they use to inject their egg under the surface of your skin. I I will warn you, today will give some of you nightmares. It's really, I love parasitism. I think it's fascinating. Um, They lay the eggs under your skin, and then those eggs hatch into little maggoty things, little worms. And those little worms live in a little pocket under your skin or under the skin of the cat or the horse or the cow or whatever. And then when they're mature they're getting nutrients from you and they're growing up and basically you are their little cocoon and when they're done growing 
they pop out of your skin on a raft of pus. Sorry. It was worse last year when I had this class um, fifth period split by lunch. We had this class 5A and 5C, and they went to lunch in the middle. They claimed I ruined their lunch often. I don't know what they were talking about. So anyway, um, you can usually tell like if a cat's got a bot or something, sometimes called a warble, because you'll look at the back, and for some reason mine always got it on the neck. You would look at the back of the neck, you'd smell something. It's a stinky cat. It smells kind of like rotten. Ugh. And you would look, and sure enough, you'd have one cat that had a perfect little hole a little bit of, I mean, you can't really see like a zit looking thing on a cat because they're covered in fur. But you would see like a little raised area, a little swollen area, and then there was very often be a little hole in the middle of it. That's weird. First time I ever encountered it. I don't know what the heck that is. So I picked the cat up and I sniffed. Oh my gosh. It's like stinky, rotten, pussy smelling. Ugh. And then I squeezed it. And a little head popped out. Ah! Oh, oh, okay. And then I knew what I was dealing with. So I took hydrogen peroxide and a little syringe with no needle, kind that you use to give like medicine to dogs or little kids. I filled it up with hydrogen peroxide and I shot it into the hole. And out on a wave of bubbles came a whole bunch of pus and one little worm. And that was it. And it healed up. It worked real nicely. So if you ever get a bot on you or a cat or a dog or anything else, remember if you inject hydrogen peroxide right into the hole, it'll flush everything out and then you can just put some antibiotic cream on it and it'll heal right up, I promise. We're actually going to watch a YouTube video on bot fly later. Um, so parasites don't want to kill you. You're their meal ticket. I want to keep you alive as long as possible. We have two major categories of parasites. We have ecto parasites who can live on their host and don't ever go inside the host's body. And these would be ectoparasites. Ecto means outside of. So ectoparasites live on the outside. And we've got fleas and ticks, leeches, lice. If anybody's ever been through a lice scare. Um, when I was an elementary student, we had a few years where there was a lice scare every winter. And back then, in elementaries, you just had a coat room and everybody threw their hats up in a pile on the shelf. You know, hung your little, I'm itching just thinking about it. And um, so once one kid has lice, every kid gets lice. I never got them, amazingly enough, but a lot of kids did. And so they'd march all the little first graders down to the nurse's office, and the nurse would sit there and comb through your hair looking for lice. Have you guys been through this? No? Yeah? Okay. And if you got them, you had to go home, and I think they washed your hair with kerosene or something equally repulsive. Yeah, it was no laughing matter. And you were out of school until you were certified clear. Like, you couldn't come back until the nurse said, yep, we're done. Um, yeah. Yeah, and here's the thing. Up until fairly recently in human history, like the last 100 years, 150 years, it was probably more common for people to have something like lice or fleas living on or with them than not. So, I mean, do you know why, you know what a lap dog is? It's a little tiny dog that can sit on your lap. Um, you know, little miniature poodles and little Yorkshire terriers and all those kind of things. Those are lap dogs. Do you know, and, and where did lap dogs originate, do you know? They were the dogs of royalty. Because a couple hundred years ago, who had time to sit around with a dog on their lap? No one but the king and queen. Everybody else was too busy working, like working hard, working from sun up to sundown, you know, harvesting food, building things. So who has time to sit around? Royalty. 
Why does royalty want a dog sitting on their lap? Well, that's one reason, but the other reason is because the dog is more attracted to the fleas than the person is, and so the dog tends to be a magnet for the fleas, and they keep the fleas off of you. It's clever. Very clever. Um, so ectoparasites live on the outside of the body. I can imagine that this would be a great recall quiz question tomorrow. Thank you. So yes, parasites can also live inside their hosts. These are endoparasites. Tapeworms, bac some bacteria are considered parasites. Roundworms, pinworms, which we're going to talk about. These are pinworms. And so many more. And I know a lot of you either hunt or fish or both, yes? Okay. You ever find a worm inside something that you were, like, field dressing? It's not uncommon. Um, a what? A worm? Okay, you found bots. Yeah, and it's deer are real prone to bots, just like horses and cows and barn cats. Um, when I worked for the Division of Wildlife doing fish surveys, we used to do the electroshocking. I've told you about this. You know, you, you have a boat with wires hanging down into the water. You create an electrical field, the fish hit the field, and they're paralyzed, and you can scoop them up and, you know, measure them, weigh them, identify them, take a scale sample. I told you about electrofishing, right? Well, <clears throat> we're electrofishing, and we were actually just testing out the equipment. We were on Walborn Reservoir, which is over by Alliance, and we pull up this enormous, beautiful smallmouth bass. And as it comes up out of the water, I see that there's something hanging down from its belly. And first I thought it was poop. I mean, you've all seen fish poop, like in a goldfish tank, I hope. It was a, like, probably one foot long tapeworm hanging out of its waist opening. So fish get tapeworms. Um, and there's a, a fish with tapeworms. So, you know, look for that when you are cleaning your catch or cleaning your kill. Now, a lot of tapeworms, a lot of parasites really are host specific. So, fish tapeworms may not be able to live in a human. Dog and cat tapeworms very often can live in humans. So, there are some parasites that are really host-specific and can only live on one kind of animal or one kind of plant. There are others that are pretty flexible. How would we think about that in terms of niche? So a parasite that can only live on one species would be a what? Specialist. Yeah. You can have a specialist parasite. Um, what about a parasite that can live on any species it comes in contact with? Generalist. So if you think about leeches, I remember as a kid pulling a turtle out of a pond, and when you looked at its poor little arms and legs, its limbs where they were sticking out of the shell, all along its limbs, it was just covered in leeches. I spent, you know, probably 45 minutes sitting there picking leeches off this poor little turtle. This little teeny turtle. They could have taken enough blood to actually do it some damage. Um, if I had stepped in the water, those leeches would have taken to me. If a dog had stepped in the water, they would have attached to the dog. They didn't care what they attached to. They just wanted blood. And they could drink reptile blood. They could drink mammal blood. Um, probably couldn't have drunk fish blood. The fish's scales protect them pretty well, I think, against leeches. Um, that's an interesting question. So, yeah, there, there are species that are very, very, very host-specific, and those are specialists. Let's write this down. So when you have a parasite that's host-specific, they can only live on one kind of host, they are specialists. Parasites who can prey on any host, like the leeches we talked about, are generalists. Which one of those is at more risk of extinction? Specialist. Oh, yeah. If you're a specialist and you only, the only thing you can eat is blood from blue-footed wombats. If the blue-footed wombat goes extinct, guess what happens to you? You go extinct. You're done. 
So again, being a generalist is a really good strategy. Generalists tend to do better. Here's the thing. Parasitic relationships drive evolution. Guess why you have an immune system? Because for the entire history of hominids, that's human-like species on the planet, things have been trying to get to you or your ancestors. They've been trying to get your blood. They've been trying to live in your body. They've been trying to eat your dead skin. They've been trying to, I don't know, do anything they can. Make you sick. Use your resources. So just like the arms race we talked about with predators, predators get better, prey gets better. If the predators get better, the prey gets better. You have evolved an immune system. All species have. You have evolved defense mechanisms to keep those parasites at bay. Now, here's the weird part. The moment in time and the place in history where you live. I want you to understand how bizarre your lifestyle is in the span of human history. Do you realize how weird your life is? Do you realize how unusual your life is? Do you realize how in the last 50,000 years of human history, pretty much no one has ever lived like you are living before? Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're living in this bizarre world there are more calories available to you than you could ever use. You are living with sanitation. You're not walking in your own poop. You're not throwing your poop out into an open ditch in front of your house. I mean, that's most of human history. You're not living with constant parasitic infections. For most of human history, humans have had one or more parasitic infections going at any one time. You're not living with a constant flea or lice infestation of your body. So, I mean, yeah, for most of human history, humans have not had enough calories. Plus, on top of not being able to obtain enough calories easily, having to really work for the calories they get, like go out, chase it down, kill it yourself. On top of how hard you had to work for all your calories, not like going to the grocery store and buying a box of Kraft Mac and cheese. On top of that, you probably had either fleas or lice or both plus maybe a tapeworm, almost certainly pinworms, who were all taking nutrients from you. Nutrients that you worked your hind end off to get in the first place. You are living this crazy, wild dream. Seriously. This is unique. Now, now that we've talked about that, let's talk about some parasites that do commonly affect humans such as us who are living this weird, modern, western, industrial dream. Remember when I asked if any of you regularly have contact with small children? Okay. <laughs> some of you look nervous, like you don't want to hear what's about to happen next. So, yes, parasitic relationships drive evolution. We're going to talk about the hygiene hypothesis in a second, but we've got our little friends, the pinworms. These guys. And I actually, there is a, and I won't, you know what, I'll be, I'll be kind. I won't show it to you, but I'm going to tell you that if you go to YouTube, and some of you are saying, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and no, I'm not going to YouTube to look this up, and you search pinworms, in colonoscopy or pinworms in patient, there are several videos. Do you know what a colonoscopy is? They stick a camera, they stick a camera up your butt. My, my dad used to go through his once a year colonoscopy. He called it up your butt with a rubber hose. Um, you drink this horrible laxative milkshake for two days. You clean out everything in your body. Your gut is supposed to be pretty much empty, and they go shove a camera up your butt. And they're looking for cancer and precancerous growths and stuff. It's for people over 40, it's 
just a normal part of the joys of aging. Um, there are several videos on YouTube of patients who show it for their colonoscopy. I mean, that's what that image is from. And on the video screen, you can see the pinworms because they live in the lower um, intestine. They live in the, in the rectum, actually. And pinworms are really, I mean, it's a great evolutionary strategy. So they, they estimate that about 80% of the planet, of humans on the planet, are infected with pinworms at any one time. Now, in modern Western industrialized nations with access to you know, flush toilets and clean water and all that stuff, you're not walking through people's feces on a daily basis, that number is a lot lower. You know, but where pinworms do tend to pop up in modern Western humans is in small children. Because small children don't have quite the same manners about hygiene that we do. So pinworms are really, this is fantastic evolutionary strategy. Pinworms live in the rectum, and the female pinworms, especially at night, come out of the rectum, and they dance around. They dance right around the anus. That's the butthole. That's where the poop comes out. And they make it itch. What do you do if something itches? Scratch it. You scratch it. While they're doing their little dance and making the butt itch, they're laying eggs on the surface of the anus and the area around it. When a little kid has an itchy butt, what does a little kid do? They stick their hand on their pants and they scratch it because they're little kids. And, you know, they haven't quite gotten the message that we don't stick our hands down our pants and scratch our bottoms yet. That takes a while to kick in. So when they scratch their itchy butt with the pinworm eggs on the surface of the butt, where do the pinworm eggs end up? On their hands. Under their fingernails. And then you know what they do? They hand you a cookie. And you know where those pinworm eggs are? On the cookie. I was a camp counselor at the age of 19 at a camp for multi... It was, it was a really cool camp. It was a, it was a great camp. And we had kids ages like 5 through 12. And um, wonderful range of kids. It was fantastic. And I came home from camp with a present from my campers. Pinworms. How do you know you have pinworms? Your butt itches like crazy. Because those female pinworms are laying their eggs and making your butt itch. What they really do, they just eat your, like, germs. They, yeah, they just, I mean, they eat some nutrients. They steal some nutrients from you. You can live with a pinworm infestation your whole life. In many parts of the world, people probably do. And their butts are constantly itchy. I mean, that's, that's the worst thing that happens is your butt itches. The test for pinworms for parents, um, and, you know, I've read up on this, if you have a kid who you, like, the, the classic is the kid who can't sit still, the kid who's always kind of squirming. They're squirming because their butt itches. And when you have the little kid who can't sit still, what you do is you wait until they're sound asleep and you go in at night with a flashlight, you pull down the pants or the diaper or whatever, and you shine a light on the butt, and you will actually see the pinworms who've come out of the rectum and are dancing around on the surface of the butt. Are they big enough that you can see They're about that long. They're about a centimeter long. They're white. Um, there's a medicine called Vermex, and you and what they say is like if you have a child or a sibling or a niece or a nephew who lives with you or somebody who has pinworms, if you're treating the little kid for pinworms, you treat everybody in the family, because the odds are, if your child has pinworms, somebody else in the house has them, and so with the Vermex, it's real easy because it's a single dose. Um, you give them a dose of Vermex. We're talking about pinworms. Here's your check. Oh. For your raffle. Oh, thank so you. Okay. Pinworms. Oh, yeah, pinworms. So um, you give them a dose of Vermex. What's Vermex? It's an anti-warming agent. We will finish talking about parasites tomorrow, and then you will have a parasite recall quiz. Let's go.